Well, today we're going to be looking at the book of John. And the title for this is The Unique Son. And that's what John is all about. John is different from the other three Gospels. The other three are called the synoptics because they are very similar. They use many of the same stories and parables and miracles. But John, which was probably written sometime later, is very different. It is the most theological and some say the most spiritual. It was probably written by John the Apostle. And John uh, wrote this when he was somewhat older. He is probably the apostle that is called in the gospel the one that Jesus loved. And so I'm going to read today the scripture, John 3.16. And if you memorize this as I did when you were a child, uh, you can say that aloud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. And that's what this is all about. Actually, the way that I'm going to approach this, I'm going to only look at three chapters. Uh, chapter 2, 3, and 4. And this deals with some of the encounters that Jesus had. Uh, first of all, there is the encounter with Mary. And if we could move on to the scripture, it says in John 2, 3, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, in this story, there was a wedding in Cana, and uh, at that wedding, people came from great distances. Now, they did not have telegraphs, <laughs> certainly didn't have cell phones. There was no telling when people were going to arrive. And so the host was supposed to have everything ready. All the food was to be prepared. All the wine was to be ready. And if it was not, if something ran out, it was a great disgrace to the family. And it was such a horrible thing. People wanted to make sure there was always plenty. So Mary went to Jesus. And she said, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said, well, woman, why are you talking to me about this? Uh, my hour has not yet come. Now, after this, she ignores what he said. That, I have now my, my second wife, and I understand that wives often ignore what we say. Uh, my wife asked if we could have a dog, and I said no. And we now have two dogs. <laughs> now, I think there must be a book that's handed down among the women about how uh, to, to deal with men. And that must be one of the things in the book. You know, about how to, when the guy says no, how to still get what you want without saying anything. So anyway, Mary said to the servants, do whatever he asks. And so Jesus told the servants, Fill these giant containers that held 25 to 30 gallons each, and they were used for ritualistic purification. It, they didn't talk about germs in that day, but this was for religious purification, and they had these great big uh, jars, and Jesus said, fill them up. And they did, and he said, well, then take a dip and bring that to the master of the ceremonies. They did. And he reported, he said, this is strange. Most often at a banquet like this, they serve the best wine first, and then after people get maybe a little tipsy later on, they bring out the inferior wine. But he said, you have saved the best wine until last. And I want you to think about that transformation that took place. Uh, some of you are probably more versed in science than I am, but I, I do know about H2O, that water, two parts hydrogen and one of oxygen, but wine is a lot more complex because the wine contains sugar, it contains alcohol, it contains 
all kinds of other chemicals in addition to the water. It is very different. And so at the microscopic level, it was completely transformed, completely changed. I think that there are a couple of meanings that we can get from this passage. First of all, it tells us about that in verse 11 of chapter 2. This was done to glorify Christ, and that certainly is important. But I think that there's another meaning. The transformation for us takes place at the very lowest of all of our levels. Our entire being is transformed by Christ. And I I know that you are like me. I, I want to be transformed by him. Not just changed a little bit on the surface, but utterly and completely transformed. I want to be, as Paul said, conformed to his image. I have died, and now Christ lives within me. Transformation. Uh, John Hutton was a well-known Welsh preacher. And one day in the middle of his sermon, this guy stood up and led the congregation in singing the doxology. And he thought that was a little bit odd, and so he wanted to talk to the man and find out what was going on. And so he went and he said to the man, well, you know, what, what's happening? He said, well, I just get so excited about how Christ has changed me. He said, before I was a drunk, he said, I even sold and pawned our furniture in order to have money to do that. He said, I sometimes knocked my wife around. But he said, I'm a completely different man today. And I'm so excited that I I sometimes can't even just sit down. And so the preacher said, well, what about the people at work? How are they responding? He said, well, I work in the pit. And some of them said, you don't really believe that yarn about changing the water into wine, do you? He said, well, I don't really know that much about water and wine. But I know that in my house he changed beer into furniture. A transformation at the atomic level. And Christ is able to transform us like that. We ought never to be satisfied with just a superficial transformation. Secondly, after the transformation, the, the encounter with Mary... There is the encounter with Nicodemus in chapter 3. It says in 3, 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now this is a fascinating story because Nicodemus, who was on the Jewish council, a very important man, a scholar, came to Jesus at night. Now, He knew that Jesus was different, but he came at night probably because he didn't want anybody else to see him. And he went to Jesus and he said, no one can do the things that you do unless the Spirit of God is in him. Now, how different was that from the other Pharisees that recognized Jesus performed miracles? Uh, They could not deny that, but they said, He cannot possibly be getting his power from God. It must be from the devil, from Beelzebub. But Nicodemus recognizes it must be coming from God. And Jesus said to him, you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Nicodemus, even though he was a Bible scholar, was confused. He said, I'm an old man. How can I possibly go back into my mother's womb and be born again? I can't do that. Can I? Jesus said, you're a teacher and you don't understand even the simple things when I say to you that you must be born again. Jesus said, flesh which is flesh, can only be flesh. And things of the Spirit can only be of the Spirit. He said, you must be born of water. And I believe that is the 
birth of the flesh. We are born with water. But he said, just being born of the flesh does not mean that you will ever see the kingdom of God. That only comes by being born again of the Holy Spirit. And so finally, Nicodemus has, come, has to come to grips with an understanding that simply being born does not save anyone. By simply being a Jew, it does not save anyone. By being born into a spiritual or a Christian family does not save anyone. You must be born of the Holy Spirit of God. It took me some time to understand how important that was. Sometimes I would tell people about Jesus, that he lived a perfect life, that he died, that he arose, and we have to believe in him. And then if they were reluctant, I would try to force it. But I, I, I came to understand, sometimes I could get a convert, but it wasn't a convert of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has to be present in their lives for them to make that kind of decision, for them to come to that understanding. I was watching a television program, a talk show one day, years ago, and a woman was asked about her beliefs, and she said, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I am not the born-again kind. I, I don't know if she was really a Christian or not. Maybe she had a complete misunderstanding, or she had never read the book of John, but Jesus says it is not an option. He said, you must be born again in order to even see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Now the ABCs of salvation are pretty simple, and that is you admit to your own sins. And the Bible says if you say that you not, are not a sinner, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Secondly, you must believe in Jesus. And the, the verse that we quoted earlier, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. And then he goes on to say, what do you have to do to be lost? He said, he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What do you have to do to be lost? Absolutely nothing. If you're born of the flesh, that's where you are until you are born again of the Spirit. In Evansville, Indiana, there was a man and he was called Old Bill. He was an old man and he lived a pretty despicable life. And Old Bill often got drunk and on one occasion he got into a fight and he lost an eye and they started calling him One-Eyed Bill. That's the way it would have ended but he came to know the Savior and it completely changed his life. He started working and volunteering at a mission in Evansville and they started calling him New Bill because he was not the same person that he was before. And he was known by that name until the day that he died. The second encounter is with Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. And then there is the final encounter. The first one, the new wine. The second, the new birth. And the third one is the encounter with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. And it says in 4.15, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. Now Jesus and his disciples did something really odd. They stopped at a Samaritan village, the village of Sychar. And that was unusual because the Jews despised the Samaritans for several reasons. First of all, they despised them because when the Jews were carried off into captivity in Babylon, 
some of the people that stayed married the people of the land, the Idumeans. And they were basically half Jews. And so when the Jews came back, they didn't want these Samaritans to participate in the building of the temple or anything else. Also, the Samaritans accepted only some books of the Old Testament, not all. The Jews worshipped at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And so the Samaritans developed their own place, Mount Gerizim, where they worshipped. And so sometimes the pious Jews, going from the south to the north, wouldn't even go in through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan to go away from them to come back into the north. And so it was unusual for Jesus to go through and then to stop there and then Jesus sent the disciples into town to find food. And while Jesus was there, a woman walked up to get water. Now, this was unusual. It was the middle of the day. Normally, the women would come together, and they would come in the morning when it was cool. But this woman came by herself. And the most logical thing to assume is because of her terrible reputation. Others didn't want to have anything to do with her, and so she was forced to come by herself. And she was really startled when Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? And she said, well, you're a Jew. <laughs> you would ask me for a drink of water? And he said, absolutely. He said, if you knew who was asking, he would give you living water. Now this living water was an amazing thing because he said, if you drink of ordinary water, you will grow thirsty again. But if you drink of the living water, it will be like an eternal spring flowing up in you, giving you eternal life. She said, well, I would love never to be thirsty and to have some of that living water. And so then Jesus said, well, bring your husband. And she didn't really want to go into that because uh, she was a great sinner. And she said, well, I have no husband. And Jesus declared, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband at all. Well, we don't really like to be confronted with our sin, and it seems that the next thing that she did was to try to change the subject. She can say, said, I, I can see you're a prophet. Where's the right place to worship? Should we worship here at Samaria, Mount Gerizim, or uh, is God to be worshipped in Jerusalem with the place of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, the time is coming that People are not going to be worshiping in any one of those. He said, God is spirit, and those that worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. I'm glad that she asked that question because it lets us know that the spirit of God is with us every Sunday where two or three are gathered in his name. The spirit of God is among us. God can be worshiped anywhere. He is everywhere present. When I lived in Canada, I went to Niagara Falls. And I even got on the little boat, uh, the Maid of the Mist. I guess some of you have been on that. and uh, You have to put on a raincoat because you get really wet. There are millions of gallons of water pouring over Niagara Falls every minute. And I couldn't help but think, ah, Jesus was even greater than that. An artesian well that never runs out. And we drink of that and we have eternal life and we are never thirsty again. A number of years ago, Henry Kissinger made the statement that everybody has to find a purpose and meaning in life. He said, even a terrorist who kills people, 
tries to find a meaning of life in that. And on that occasion, Henry Kissinger was right. You and I find our purpose, our meaning in Christ. He is the living water. He gives us a purpose and a meaning that we could not have otherwise. And so all you see in uh, the book of John, all the new things, uh, the new wine, the new birth, uh, the new water, the living water. And at the center of all of this is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Only begotten. You know, that's one way of translating it. The word is monogonous in Greek. You're probably not interested in that. But let me tell you how it is often translated in Greek. It is often translated unique. You and I are children of God. We are children because God has adopted us by our profession of faith in Christ, by making him our Lord. But Jesus was the unique Son of God, the only one that never sinned, the only one that was perfect, and the one that died on the cross that we might have eternal life. What a great message that is. And because of what Christ has done, we are to live our lives in perpetual gratitude. In Victoria Station in London, some years ago, there were three men that got on the train. And one man was sitting on one side and two others on the other side. Those two men were fairly young, in their 30s. And as the train pulled out about 20 minutes later, one of those men began to have a seizure. And the other one you know, held him up, took off his coat and put it under the man's head. And then he took his handkerchief and he wiped his face and his mouth. And he just said calming words until the man finally was able to calm down. And he looked at the one that was sitting across from him and he said, we apologize for that. This sometimes happens two or three times a day. He said, my friend and I were in Vietnam together, and we were both shot. I was shot in my legs. I could not walk. And he was shot in the shoulder. Helicopter was supposed to come, but it did not. And so he said, my friend picked me up and started carrying me, and there were shots all around from the Viet Cong. He said, many times as he was walking, trying to carry me, I told him, just put me down and save yourself, but he refused. He said, how he managed to walk for three and a half days until we got out of the jungle, I will never know. He said, about five years ago, I learned that he had this medical condition. And so I sold my home and got what money I had and came to take care of him. And he looked at the guy across from him and said, you know, after what he did for me, there isn't anything that I would not do for my friend. Jesus has done so much more than that for all of us. He lived a life. He was beaten with whips that cut all the way to the bone. He bled. He was nailed to a cross with iron nails, and he died there that you and I might have salvation. And what we are to do is to live every day in gratitude for what he has done. That changes us. We become new. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we thank you for this day and for your word that instructs us, and we pray that you might help us to live in accordance with your purpose. God, not only change us, but transform us. Make us truly after the image of Christ. And we pray that when other people see us as we go through our lives, that they will see Christ. Forgive us, God, when we fail you. 
We do pray today for those that have concerns and needs. Be with Bill and his medical condition. We pray for Gary, that you'll be with him as he has his operation. Uh, be with Marvin, and God, we ask that you'll guide him and also be with Barbara. And finally, God, we pray for Catherine, that you will help her and John during this very difficult time in their lives. For any others in our congregation or our friends and families, we pray that you might watch over us. Thank you, God, for who you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.